Good evening all, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments Australia. Tonight we are really excited to bring you VCE Specialist Mathematics with Raymond Rosen and Peter Flynn. My name is John Bayman and I am your host for this event. I teach mathematics to Year 7 to 12 students at Lachlan Catholic College Darwin where I use TI technology to help students make stronger connections in their understanding of mathematics. I'm excited to introduce our first panelist for this evening, Mr. Raymond Rosen. Good evening, Ray. Hello, Peter. And John. <laughs> Good evening. As you can see, Raymond is a guru on all aspects of the VCE mathematics methods, mathematical methods, sorry, and specialist mathematics courses. He shares this knowledge as an educator, writing textbooks and presenting at national and international conferences, as well as joining us tonight. Ray. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Our second panelist for this evening is Mr. Peter Flynn. Good evening, Peter. Hello. Peter is a lecturer at the University of Melbourne and, like Raymond, a T-cubed instructor. Peter's knowledge of CAS is more than any guidebook and he is always willing to share this knowledge with others. Peter, likewise, thank you for joining us. Cheers. Feel free to send any questions at any time to Raymond or Peter using the Q&A window on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a general reminder, tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be available to re-watch or share on your on-demand webinar page on the TI Australia website. We are expecting a large crowd this evening, and I've already seen the numbers creeping up, so thank you for joining us. So your audio is automatically muted, I'm sorry. Um, we hope you don't have any audio issues, but if you do, try pressing communicate in the WebEx menu, choose audio broadcast, and then click join. So thank you gentlemen for joining us, and Ray, I will pass everything over, and it's now all yours, my friend. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Raymond Rosen, and I teach specialist maths and mathematical methods at um, RMIT. So tonight we're going to have a look at some relational graphing, some polar graphing, and some vectors and parametric equation graphing. The first feature I want to go through is the relational graphing. Now, this is a fairly new feature for the TI Inspire. We did have a limited version of this, but now on a graphs page, if we press Menu, Graph Entry Edit, and go across to option number two, the relation operation. Here we can type in any sort of uh, polynomial or even with trigonometric functions. For example, I can type in um, x equals cos y. I could have got cos y from the template, but I can just type it in, and that'll give me the relation x equals cos y. Not only that, I can then edit it, for example, and we can have less thans or equal tos. So we can have less than a relational operator as well. So that's a very nice new feature. Now, one of the features that um, also applies here for this is that if I'm on a calculator page, for example, I can define my relation. Just like we can define a function f1 of x, we can define a relation. So the relations are called rel1, and they are functions of two variables, x, comma, y. So, for example, if I type in some sort of nasty relational operation plus, uh, say, 2 times x times y plus, say, 3 times x. I don't know, we're just making this one up. This is not a parabola or a hyperbola or an ellipse or anything like that because it's x to the fourth. And, say, plus 2 times y equals, say, 10. Because I've defined that on the calculator page, when I go across to my graphs page now, and it's automatically displayed and graphed for me. So that's one of the nice little features of this. Not only that, but because that graph is known to the calculator page, I can perform operations on it, such as implicit differentiation and things like that. So for example, if I go Menu, Calculus, and come down and find the um, implicit differentiation, and just hit the var command to bring up relay, uh, rela Relation 1, type in x, comma y, get out of there and go comma x comma y, that will then give me the, the um, dy dx in terms of both x and y for that relation. Okay? So nice little features that we can type them in from the calculator screen or from the graphs page as I showed you before. 
Now, another little feature here is that if I was, for example, to plot, say, the graph of, say, y equals uh, 1, for example, then we could find the points of intersection for the x values when y is 1. Now, this can be done in a number of ways. We can do an analyzed graph, for example, and find the point of intersection between these graphs. And it'll ask me for the second graph, and then it asks me for the first corner, and we just um, join the two values here, and it'll find the point of intersection. Just moving around a little bit. Now let's just try that one again. We can alternatively do that, for example, on the um, calculator page as well by going, for example, Algebra Solve, Menu, Algebra, Solve. So what do I want to solve? I want to solve, for example, where that relation, x comma y, I want the y value to be 1, so where that relation is equal to, say, 1 or f of x1, and I want to solve that equation for x. So that gives me, it didn't work, solve rel1 equals x for x. Okay, solve, it's not an expression, it's just solve that. So that gives me the two values that I'm after there. So rel1 is actually an expression. So that two values of x represent the two values of x on this graph here. So let's just try that one again. If we can go analyze graph and find the um, points of intersection between the first graph and that second graph. And it's just moving, it's not quite doing what we want it to do. So that value there is the point x1, x1 equals 1.27. All right, so that's some ideas with relational functions. Most relational functions of polynomial types can all be sketched, okay? There are some limitations with some sort of polynomials, but we can get some really nice sort of graphs appearing there. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll have a look at some of the other types of graphs, for example, that we can plot here. One of these is a parametric plot, which is just deciduous figures. And these are of the form x equals cos mt, y equals sine mt. So let's go to a graphs page again. So we'll press the on key and go to a graphs page. And this time we want to go to parametric plotting. So we'll press menu. Notice that all these windows are context sensitive because I'm in a graphs page now, they're graphing. So we'll come down to parametric and for x1t, I'll enter cos of n times t. I have to go n times t and for the y, I'll enter sine. I can type in sine m times t. Now again, one of the nice little features of these uh, graphing things now with the newer versions is that if you put in a parameter there, n and m, it'll automatically ask me for sliders for both m and n. So yes, I want to create sliders for both of these. So we'll get the sliders and um, we can move them out of the way. So we want a nicer viewing window as well. So we'll move this out of the way and let's, um, let's uh, choose a nice viewing window here. So we'll go for a window setting. I don't know, say negative 2 to 2. Steps of 1, y minimum, say negative 2 to 2 and steps of 1 as well. All right, so let me get these sliders and uh, move them out of the way a little bit and also change some of the properties of these settings. So with a right click to bring up the attributes command, we can control the settings of this slider. Its variable is n. Value is 1, that's okay. The minimum value, I'll say, is 1. The maximum, I'll say, is 10. The step size, I'll say, is 1. Now, one, if we keep scrolling down, we see this other little feature, which I'll click on, which is minimize. That will then minimize the slider to take up less room on the screen. Let me just do a similar thing for um, the other slider. Let's move that one out of the way as well. And, um, see what happens when we control and move this slider. Let's move that one. That's a lovely feature. Uh, it's a lovely feature, isn't it, uh, Raymond, how it automatically gives you the option of those sliders. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That was a fairly newer version has, has brought yeah. that out. Typically used to say y equals mx plus c to show sort of students how we can actually move a, a graph just with simple, simple values here. So we're just making this document look rather, rather nice by moving these things out of the way. Okay. All right, now, 
these are listed Jewish figures and I've got N as 1 and M as two, 3 there and that sort of looks like a familiar what uh, Channel 2 sort of logo or listed Jewish figures or infinity symbols. One of the really nice little features of sliders is that again when we do a right click on these I can animate them. So if I animate it, I'm not pressing any keys now, we can see we get some really, really nice sort of graphs here for various values of M and N. Once again change the value of N here, we get some more nice values. So, you know, if M is equal to N, what have we got? I think we've got uh, circles. If M is uh, not, if M was double N, what have we got? Or if M is triple N, we could even investigate this one further by having a look at fractional values like M and N being like 2.5 or um, 3.5 and things like that. So we get some really sort of nice graphs and this was very quite easily, quite easily to, um, to construct this, this um, animation here. So I'll stop the animation. Now if I was to put in different numbers here, such as a 2 and a 3, I could even have sliders for those as well, we get sort of uh, larger graphs that have to increase the screen size and the, and the window zoom and things like that. But then we get ellipses and things like that as well. All right, so that's having a look at um, some simple graphs of relational operators and some graphs of um, parametric defined functions. Let's, let's have a look now at the other one we want to look at today and that's um, some polar plots. Okay, so let me move into say what's called some roses here. So if I'm on a graphs page again and this time we'll graph entry edit, we've seen the functions, that's f1 of x and uh, general functions the relations, the equation templates, um, they're specifically designed for what lines, parabolas, circles, ellipses and hyperbolas and conics. The parametric ones we've just looked at, uh, Peter will look at scatter plots and sequence equations and differential equations, but for the moment now I want to look at some polar plots. Now polar plots are generally defined in terms of R1 of theta equals a function of theta. So the first one I'll do is just say sine theta. Now you have to enter theta here. To get the theta, we'll get that from the control book, which is the alpha beta, which is the uh, catalog for these uh, Greek symbols here. So the theta is highlighted, so I'll press theta, and once again we'll get a, this one is a circle. Uh, once again, I will just improve the viewing window here to get some nicer viewing windows. So I don't think minus 10 to 10. I want to try to sort of maintain the aspect ratio, so I'll try like minus 1.6 to 1.6 steps of 1. For the y values, I don't know, I'll try 1.2 to say 1.2 steps of 1. So that gives me a circle. Now, if I was to change the sine theta to a cos theta, the circle center was in on the y-axis, now the circle center is on the um, x-axis. What about if we change it and make it 2 theta? What are we going to get here? Looks like we get a four-leaf rose. What about if we were to change that to say 3 theta? We only get a three-leaf clove, clove or petals or flowers, whatever you want to call them. What are they generally called, people? I don't know. We'll try n theta. And once again, we'll be prompted to create a slider for n, which we'll do. Now, I was playing with this one and we can change the settings here. Uh, the minimum value is generally positive integers here, 1 up to say 9, step size of 1. We could even try step sizes of half which would see what would happen. But if we do that, we might have to increase the values of the stepping sizes up to say 4 pi or 6 pi or something like that. So this one is a 2, when it's 2 we've got 4. When it's 3, we've got 3. When it's 4, we've got, what, 8. And 5, we've got 5. And the same thing happens if I change the sine to a cos, or sine or cos. All right, so five petals, four petals, or leaves, or roses, whatever we want to call them. I think we can generalize from this. Well, this is not theoretically a proof, um, if R equals A sine N theta or A cos N theta, if N is even, then we'll get two N leaves, but if N is odd, then we only get N leaves. Um, what other features could we actually do there? We could also change the colour of any of these graphs as well. 
We can do that by a right click, which brings up the, the attributes command or the colors command. We can change the color of any of these graphs to say red. We could bring that up again with the attributes command and change them to dotted or anything or uh, line weight medium or thicker or thick or whatever we like. So all of these functions, the parametric, the new relational and the polar can all be done with some sort of things like this. We could all have continuous or dotted or uh, whatever we like. So there's a number of options that we could try for these Ray, graphs as well. Ray, somebody just yep. asked. Obviously, you're using the teacher software here and, and using right click as in on the mouse. If yep. a student was Control using a handheld, menu. how do they do yep. the same thing? Control menu is the way to bring that one up, the attributes command. Control menu if you're doing it on a handheld or a, uh, or on a not a computer screen. Yes, I know it's, very, it's a lot easier to do these things on the computer screen than what it is to do on the handheld, but all of them can be done in a similar way. Great, thank you. All right. Let's have a look at um, one more application that I want to have a look at. And this is a general sort of problem. This one is sort of very similar to one question which was on a VCE exam last year regarding two ships. So I've got two ships. This is a worked example we'll go through here, which is a parametric one. So two ships A and B are observed from a lighthouse at an origin O. Relative to the origin, their position vectors at time t hours are given by Ra of t, t plus 2i, t squared minus 5t plus 6, and Rb. Displacements are measured in kilometres. Now there's a number of questions we have to do here, and that's to find, to sketch the paths of each ship, to find when and where the ships collide, the Cartesian equation of both ships, and to find the times when the ships are travelling with the same speed. All right, so to save a little bit of time, if I just scroll to the next page here, I've typed in x1 of t and y1 of t and x2 of t and y2 of t. They're just from the equations which were given. However, that doesn't actually describe the position vector or the vector equation of the path at any time t. So to do that, what I will do is I will open up, uh, go to the templates here and get a two by one matrix. And in this two by one matrix, I'll type in x1 of t and tab to the other coordinate here. And I could just type in the var command, hit the var command and get y1 of t. Now get out of that by pressing the arrows. And now I'm going to store that one to ra of t. So that gives me the position vector of the first ship, ra of t. Rather than type all that in again, to save time, I can just press up arrow and change that to RB and change both of these to 2. So that's going to give me the position vector of ship B. In the parametric form now, I could sketch the graphs. So let's just move along to a graphs page now and see um, if those two graphs are there. Well, we're in, param we're in function mode. Let's go into the parametric mode and up arrow, there's X1. So if I hit enter there, that will be the first ship. And if I press um, F2 now, a bit of a problem here. I think we actually have to um, define this only for what T greater than or equal to zero. And we need to probably go up a bit more. So generally we look in terms of pi's here. Perhaps we'll go up to say 12 for that one. And for the other one, we'll go up in steps of um, uh, 10 as well. So let's get the other graph up there as well for parametric. This is x2. And we'll probably put that one as a different value. So there's the other ship. So it looks like these ships are going to cross what there and maybe a bit higher up. So we'll just change the y value here. There's another little clue here. If you just click on the um, y maximum value, we can type in a value there and press tab and it'll move us around the screen. So we can easily get this rather than doing a window setting, for example, minus 10. That's a nice little trick, the old tab. Nice work there, yeah. Raymond. It doesn't, um, it doesn't change the X scale and the Y scale, but um, we, can, we can work with that one. All right, so now do these two ships cross or do they intersect or what's happening? Well, to find that out, all we have to do then is figure out the times when they're at the same positions. So if I go solve... RA of T, 
R A of T equals R B of T and I want to solve that for T. And that gives me T equals 6. Now, we can actually show that they are at the same position when T is 6. So if I go R A of 6, and let me just edit that one to make R B of 6, then it appears that at time T equals 6 hours, they're both at the point 8 metres and 12 metres across. But it looked like from the graph that they actually crossed twice. But what's happening on that graph is that that one would be the one where T is 6, what's happening here? Now, that point looks like the point 1, 2, 3, 4, looks like the point 4, four 0. So let me just say work out some um, RA at 2, that's at the point 4, 0. And what is RA, R of A, if I try R of B at 4? That's also at the point 4, 0. So the two ships are at the same coordinate, but at different times. So what that means is their paths are crossing, but although their paths are crossing, they're not, they're not going to collide at that point because they're at that point at different times. All right, so let, let's finally finish off here with trying to find the Cartesian equation. So to do that, I'll have to eliminate the parameter t to find out if they're both um, parametric curves. So let me just change that to, say, x of t. And basically what I'm trying to do here is eliminate the t from these two equations. So obviously if we solve x of t equals t, for t, we didn't really need the CAS to do this, it's fairly, straight, fairly easy, t is equal to x minus 2, but the whole point here is that I want to substitute that value of t into y1. So I do that with the given command. The given command is control equals, and this I really like this given command, a very substitute or given or, or substitute in, and now press the up arrow. So that then gives me the Cartesian equation of the first ship. So I will define that one, menu, actions, define. I'll call that one F1 of X for the first ship and I'll say that that's equal to that. Now again, a little problem. If we think about this, T represented time and T was only greater than or equal to zero, which means that this is really only defined for X bigger than two. So once again, I'll have to define that with a restricted domain question to say x is bigger than or equal to 2. And that's defined my x, my function of the first ship. OK, let's do a similar thing for the second ship. Scroll up and find this one here, which was x2. And what I want to do is solve that for t. So we'll do a similar thing that we just did. Let's solve x equals 2t minus 4 for t. That gives me t. And then I'm going to substitute that into my second parametric equation for y. So y2 of t given the so control equals given that t equals x plus 2. That will then give me my Cartesian form. But here, what values of t? x must be because t is greater than or equal to 0 here. I think we're going to need x to be greater than or equal to 4. So let's go menu, actions, define, and define f2 of x equal to that, but only for x greater than or equal to 4. Uh, negative 4, actually, because that's the smallest value. OK, so when I now go across onto my calculator page, I've only got those two graphs there, but if we, if we hit the um, graph entry edit screen and look at the function equation, then they're both there. And we see that that corresponds to the same graph of the one that we had before. So we've got multiple representations of this same graph. And once again, let's do it for um, the second one. And that should just cover up the first one. It's a shame they both ended up with the same colour. Let's just change the colour of say, that one to say pink. And you can see that it's the same colour, so it's the same graph. So we've got the parametric equation there. All right, the one other little nice little feature of all of this stuff that we can do here is that we can actually differentiate these functions. If you recall, the question asked us to find 
We've done when and where the ships collide, the path, when and where the ships are travelling with the same speed. Well, we can actually differentiate this um, vector here. So we'll go, well, well, where will we get it? Well, we'll define, how about we define, define a velocity of the vector A, or ship A, to be equal to the derivative of the position vector of ship A. So if I click on this template here, we have a derivative command, d by dt of r of A. And I can simply get that from the var command and r of A of t. So that gives me the velocity at time t of ship A. Once again, just pressing up arrow and editing that one will give me the velocity of ship B. All right, so I can actually see what these functions are if I want to find them. Now that's the position, that's the velocity in terms of i's and j's, but if we want the speed, speed is the norm. Now if we want to get that, we go to matrices and vectors and norms. So a norm is like a magnitude of a vector, and here I'll type in v a of t, and let's just do a similar thing for the uh, speed of ship B. And what we wanted to do is to find the times when they're travelling at the same speeds. So we want to solve the value of T when norm A is equal to norm B. We wanted to solve that for T. So at time one and a half hours, they're travelling at the same speed. And we can easily verify that by substituting in t equals 3 on 2 into that speed, we get root 5. And if we substitute the, uh, t equals 3 on 2 into that speed, we also get, hopefully, root 5. OK, so that's a nice little example here. So in summary for this question, both ships are travelling on parabolic paths, as we see. The ships collide at time t equals 6 because they're at the same point at that same time. Their paths crossed at the point 40, but they pass through this point at different times, and they're travelling at the same speed when t equals 3 on 2. Now, just one other point perhaps we should make, that if they, they did collide at this point um, time t equals 6, they might not be still travelling after that. They might have sunk, but anyway, that's a, a little <laughs> joke there. All right, let's just start. Before I pass over to Peter, I just want to show you perhaps one other couple of examples that we can do here of um, multiple representations of some curves. Uh, for example, we can have a polar curve, a parametric curve, or a uh, relational curve, and they can all have um, the same representations. So what I've just done then is press control up arrow to give me what the thumbnail view of all this sort of uh, uh, document. And what I want to do here is just to, just to finish off with this. There are many famous curves which can be defined in what's called Cartesian form, polar form or parametric curve form. Many of these elegant curves can now be easily sketched with CAS calculators. These can lead to calculus questions such as finding areas, volumes, tangent lines, arc lengths, or even surface areas. Now, if you're interested in some of these um, famous sort of curves, there's quite a few textbooks around. Uh, I found one online, 50 Famous Curves, Lots of Calculus Questions and a Few Answers by Steve Kukoska. I think he's one of the T3 trainers in America, actually. And another textbook is a catalogue of um, special plane curves by Dennis Lawrence. Alternatively, if you just Google and Wikipedia and Wolfram Alpha, you'll find, um, or Maths World, you'll find many of these uh, curves mentioned. For example, cycloids, um, things like that. So rather than typing all these in here, I thought I'd just show you a couple of these. We've got a, a figure eight curve here which can be defined parametrically in terms of um, x equals a cos t, y equals a sine t. It can also be defined as a relational graph as well, and also as a polar graph. And because I've plotted all three of them on the one axis, and like I showed before, the functions are all overlapped, they're the same. The value of a can also be changed as a slider, but I think I've just used a is equal to one. Once again, you can get these curves on a calculator page, and use implicit differentiation on them or solve equations and use them as, as you would normal functions F1, which is a nice little feature. All right, so perhaps we've got um, one more just to show you. And all these documents will be available. Um, there's famous curves here, 
asteroids, cardioids, um, lots of these. Let me just um, perhaps scroll down to one nice one which has got uh, folium descartes. There's lots of these curves. So there's another and one. Where Raymond, got... will these be available um, to um, attendees after the webinar? Yes, I can give I can give these um, these uh, documents up there. Yes. Fantastic. So yes, uh, the, these these documents uh, basically similar to what I've done, and um, all of these famous curves will be up there with those references as well. So we've got uh, folium of Descartes, which is again as a relational operator, the polar form of these and the parametric form of these graphs. So once again, if you plot all of these, you see they're the same. Now, one of these actually included sort of the asthmatote to this graph, which doesn't normally appear with all the graphs, but sometimes some of these relational or the uh, parametric or the polar graph actually puts in the, uh, the asthmatote. Some of these graphs are, are not available in all three formats, such as relational, uh, parametric and polar, uh, but sometimes you get all three combinations of them. Sometimes you only get a polar or a parametric or a, or a relational. But uh, there are some nice curves there and as I said if you're interested in those you can have a look at those two reference books or go to a library or we'll, we'll, we'll from Alpha or Wikipedia and just type in the word cycloid and a lot of these uh, graphs are, are very, very nice and you can get the how they're constructed by, for example, balls rolling on balls or if you remember as a kid you might have done something with spirographs and things like that. Uh, so there's lots of these uh, famous curves around. All right, I think I've um, covered my little bit. We'll pass over to uh, Peter to look at some, what, para some uh, differential equation and some sequence plotting of some complex numbers, I think. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Raymond. And just as I'm passing over to Peter, a quick question that um, we, I thought you were going to answer for me. Uh, somebody asked, uh, will the teacher software, so is this, sorry, is there an advantage of having the teacher software over the student software? As far as this, I don't think so. No, I think all of this should be available on student software as well. I think the teacher software has just got the extra features for adding uh, uh, questions and answers, I, I believe. But yes, you'll definitely be able to uh, plot all those graphs and uh, in, in either form for all of that. However, this is, this is, these features are on version 4.4. And if you're only using, say, for version 4.2, you won't be able to do these relational plots and you certainly won't be able to get them from the calculator page to the uh, graphs page as I was showing you before to um, play with them on the, and, and do implicit differentiation on them. Yeah, okay. That's a great uh, point. There are some very have... nice curves there anyway, anyway to, to sketch, they certainly are. especially the roses and um, all sorts of them. So thanks. No, thanks for that. And I've also put into um, into the uh, chat window uh, information on how to update the calculators and where that can be found on the CI Australia website. Yeah, we'll put them in so, after the um, webinar, I believe. So in yeah. a couple of days, no, they'll be there oh, for sure. Yeah, fantastic. And Peter, I can see your screen. I can see you waiting patiently. So over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, King. So the reason for tonight's webinar was to try and give you an overview of different um, graphing modes that are useful for specialist mathematics. Uh, particularly in Victoria in relation to Unit 1, Unit 2 um, and Unit 3. So Raymond's done an excellent job there with regards to polar graphing, and para which is I think um, later in Specialist Maths Unit 1 and 2. Uh, parametric graphing um, and also showing you the recent sort of additional features or the power of um, relation graphing. So my role tonight is um, just to follow up and give you some idea about some sequence graphing, which is useful for uh, Unit 1 specialist maths in particular uh, when you're looking at um, recursive relationships, recurrence relations. Uh, I'll then go on to talk about uh, how scatter plots can be useful in the teaching of complex numbers. Uh, there's a reasonable chance that I won't have enough time to talk about um, differential equation uh, graphing and it's, that's a, um, an aspirational goal. If I get a couple of minutes to talk about it, well, well and good. So the thing about sequence graphing and what's been uh, problematic for TI over the years is we've been locked into uh, graphing uh, recurrence relations where you've got un equals something in terms of un minus 1 or un minus 1 plus or minus uh, un minus 2. We've been locked into that. 
With Operating System 4.4, and as a result of years of agitation by our great friend uh, Russell Brown, who many of you will know, and a big cheerio to, to Russell, uh, he's finally got some um, Texas Instruments in, in, uh, in, in TI Inspire um, to be able to uh, look at sequences other than UN equals. So we can now look at UN plus one equals, UN plus two equals, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we've got a more adaptable uh, feature when it comes to studying uh, recurrence relations and sequences generated from those recurrence relations. What I'm about to show you, uh, it only works in the uh, graphs uh, application. So uh, the other thing here is, as you can see my screen, um, I've already set up a window that will work for uh, what I want to achieve. But just in case, uh, if you press menu number four for window zoom and then number one for window settings, that will allow you to manually set a, a viewing window. So what we need to do is we need to call up the, the entry line and we also need to ensure that we're in sequence graphing mode. So if we press menu, and then I don't like this phrase graph entry edit. Um, really, it's, it's, it, it should be graph mode. You know, we want to change the mode of, of graphing. So if we press number three, then we see number seven for sequence, and you've got a choice between se sequence and custom. So you'll choose sequence here. Um, custom uh, is, is a really nice environment for studying um, predator prey models, for example. So if we press one or enter, uh, what you'll notice uh, is we get the entry line related to sequence graphing. And in the past, UN, sorry, U1 of N was um, unable to be edited. Uh, but what you can do now is you can go in and edit it and change that to U1 of N plus 1, for example. So if you're on operating system 4.3 or less, you won't be able to do this. And this is motivation for you to continue to be um, up to date with the latest operating uh, system. You don't want to be preventing students um, from being able to get answers correct because you, um, you know, you're a bit slack in this um, venture. So you've got to be up to date, just like you would be with your phone and with Windows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we've got UN, sorry, I keep saying that U1 of N plus one what we can do is we can say that that's equal to uh, un uh, plus uh, u of n minus 1. So what you'll see there is uh, it this looks like a Fibonacci related uh, recurrence relation. So it's a second order linear difference equation, another way to, to describe it, where what we're saying is we're taking um, the two previous terms, adding them together to get the, the next term. Um, I could have u1 of n plus 2 here if I, if I um, so desired. So the initial terms uh, we can say are 1 and 1, and we can also adjust uh, the, the number of terms. So we want, say, the first 20 numbers generated by this recurrence um, relation. And if we do this, uh, as usual, what happens when we're live is something goes wrong. So what went wrong? I see what went wrong. U1, U1. Right, so that's a, a useful um, situation to consider is you need to ensure that it's U1 um, throughout. So if we press enter, ah, that's looking a lot better. So we've got our uh, sequence uh, here. And what you'll also notice is that the initial terms are in green and then subsequent terms in this situation um, are in blue. Okay, so it, it, it um, gives you a nice indication of those initial term values. And if we wanted to see a tabular um, representation of this, uh, all you would need to do is press Control T and you'll get a split screen representation whereby we've got our familiar Fibonacci sequence tabulated on the right-hand side, and then what we've got is we've got the graphical representation uh, on, on the left-hand side. So this is a really exciting development for us. 
because now we can get the students to match the, the difference equations or recurrence relations that they meet in their questions exactly with the right, um, let's call them subscript uh, values if, uh, um, in the in the TI Inspire uh, environment, which is really good. I guess one other thing to consider is there's always that problem of the subscript is n plus one, but when you uh, are entering the uh, recurrence relation, you know, for example, it looks as though that it's a function. So that's the thing that you um, have to um, ensure that the students, to the best of your ability, that, that they understand that. Um, so if we go to the second uh, page, what we've got here is we've got a preset um, window again. And what we can do is we can graph the ratio of um, a, a term in the sequence uh, compared to the previous term in the sequence. And we can see what that looks like. So if I um, press tab and I see, OK, I'm back uh, in my function graphing mode. So if I press menu, graph entry, edit, and then number seven for sequence, number one for sequence, notice that um, it's, out, it's operating like a counter. So U1 of has been um, taken up, so now we're in U2. So if we say, OK, we want U2 uh, N, if we want that to be equal to, so we'll press Control divided by to get the uh, fraction template pasted onto the entry line. And then we say that that's U1 uh, on N, U1 N plus 1 on U1 N. And um, again, we can have initial terms 1 and 1. And we can change this so that we're just looking at the first um, 20 terms and we press uh, enter. What you see there uh, is we've got our initial terms and then what's happening is it appears as though that that ratio is converging um, to a particular value. Now I haven't got enough time to go through uh, all the mathematics in involved here. But what you can also do is introduce students to the golden ratio, either through the golden section or the golden rectangle, and um, get them to uh, understand that the golden ratio phi uh, has an exact value, and its exact value is 1 plus root 5 all over 2. And then what you can do is um, you can graph that horizontal line to get a sense of that this particular ratio is converging towards uh, the golden ratio. Uh, my feeling here is that um, it's probably outside the scope of the course to be able to prove it mathematically, but I think it's nice enough to see it uh, just graphically and, and also uh, numerically. So if we now press menu and then graph entry edit and function, in here if we now use the fraction template and we say we want 1 plus uh, the square root of 5 uh, divided by 2 and we'll be fancy and we'll say given. So that's control equals and if you just go 1 to the left it takes you there so that saves students a few milliseconds um, in the exam rather than going da -da 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 to the right and down. And then we say alright we want x um, greater than or equal to zero, uh, we do this and we, if you wanted to, we can totally show you can change the attributes and um, we can change the uh, line style to dashed and uh, so that gives you a, a nice demonstration uh, of, of that. Um, as I said, I think it's uh, all you would need to do is to do this graphically numerically um, it, it's, it's quite a bit of um, detailed and formal mathematics to be able to prove it um, formally. Uh, and one other thing that I can show you is here we've got the ratio of a term to the previous term. What happens when we flip it and we say what's the ratio of a term to the next term? Uh, what, do we, what do we get? So if we press menu, graph entry, edit, and then number seven 
for sequence, number one for sequence. And now, um, if we plot the ratio of um, a term to the next term, like so, and then we'll be consistent with our initial terms and also with the number of terms as well. Uh, we press uh, enter and you'll see there that um, that's also converging to a value and what's really nice is we can look now at the changing it to function graphing and if we graph the reciprocal of the golden ratio, oh now I have the golden ratio uh, in F1 of X, so if we graph 1 for F2 of X, if we graph 1 on F1 of X, we see that it's converging to a particular value uh, again, which is uh, really lovely, um, like so. And so what's going on there is you've got this beautiful relationship that 1 on phi is equal to um, phi minus 1. And from there you generate the quadratic phi squared minus phi minus 1 equals 0. And when you solve that, uh, you, one of your solutions is obviously phi. And 1 on phi, so if phi is 1 plus root 5, or the other way around, and root 5, 5 plus 1 over 2, then 1 on phi ends up being root 5 minus 1 um, over 2. So that's something that you could um, get the students to, to look at as well. So this is um, part of the Specialist Maths um, Unit 1 course. So I think that that's um, a useful feature uh, for students and teachers. The sequence graphing mode is an important part of, of Specialist Maths. And this is the message that we want to get across to you tonight that um, all the graphing modes are very, very important in the study of this, of this wonderful um, subject. So without any further ado, and I suppose the other thing we could do is if you press um, Control T, what, what do we get? And, and see there we can um, get a sense of numerically what's going on. All right, so it's converging to, so you, can, you can tell that it's phi minus 1 because it's 0.618, blah, 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 blah. And phi is obviously 1.618, blah, 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 blah. OK. The next little demo I want to show you, actually my philosophy about webinars is just showing um, simple things that are demonstrable um, in the classroom, is to look at the use of scatter plots um, in the teaching of complex numbers. So when you teach complex numbers uh, and you're looking particularly at the conjugate root theorem uh, and the fundamental theorem of algebra, my feeling is that you probably look at them from very algebraic viewpoints and occasionally what you'll do um, is you'll plot the nth roots of unity on an argand diagram or you'll plot um, the roots of a cubic where the coefficients are real and get a sense that you, you, you know, you're a chance to get one real root and um, two complex roots and they're a, con and they're a, um, a conjugate pair. Well, we can go a bit better than that and a, and a bit more wide than that, and we can actually do it numerically, graphically um, as well to enhance the, the teaching of uh, these two important concepts. So the page that I'm showing you here is a notes page, and I'll need to unpack a little bit of this. Um, and I'll show you how to add a, 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 a Mac box in a moment. It's Control-M for the shortcut, or you can go through the uh, menu um, to, to, to find it. But the first thing I want to point out is that we're assigning, so assigning is um, colon equals, so control symbols template is uh, colon equals. So f of x has been assigned to be signum k times a random polynomial x comma n. So this idea um, was developed by Peter Fox and also the I overall idea was developed by Raymond Rosen and, and Raymond presented this uh, in America. So we need to acknowledge those two uh, gentlemen. Now the signum function is interesting. Signum function of x where x is real is negative 1 when x is less than 0. It equals 0 when x equals 0 and it equals 1 when x is greater than 0. So 
for example, signum 1 is 1, signum 2 is 1, signum 3 is 1, signum 4 is 1. And what that um, pass of f of x actually does is it acts like a counter. So you'll see on the next page that when we're generating random polynomials, we can generate random polynomials of the same degree and, and look at um, the roots on the, on the complex plane. Random polynomial is found in the catalogue and um, you can tell in there is already uh, bold and non italicized that may sort of values. And um, what happens is that you can have a degree of this of a polynomial from 0 to 99 and the random polynomial will generate uh, random polynomials where the coefficients are random integers between negative 9 and 9. So what I've done uh, next, you can see here, is that the roots have been assigned to be the complex zeros of f of x. So there we've got, um, they're the three uh, complex uh, roots, uh, given, hopefully given that n equals 3, it, it, it is. Then what we do is we have the real part is assigned to be the real part of the root, so they're our real parts. The imaginary part has been assigned to be the imaginary parts of the root, so they're our imaginary parts. And then the number of roots has been assigned to be dim of roots. Dim stands for dimension, and what it's doing in this instance is it's just counting the number of elements in a list. So the number of elements in this list is 3, so dim of roots is 3. Now to um, add a box, all you can do, uh, control M is the shortcut, but if you go menu, 3 for insert, and then number 1 for map box, uh, I'm going to do this for a reason um, on the next page. I'm going to say that NR, we can assign that to be um, dim of uh, roots and of, of course you can get roots from by pressing the bar key uh, there and it's interesting that that's all changed colour um, but uh, anyway the NR has been assigned to be dim of roots. We're going to use that on, on the next page. So if we go to the next page uh, what you see on this screen is you see the three uh, roots. Now I need to make a comment that what you would do with the students is you hide these, right? You hide them because what can happen is that what's generated uh, here um, ends up not being in sequence with what's generated on the screen. But that doesn't matter if, that's, uh, if the notes page is, is hidden. So what we see here is uh, notice that the axes labels aren't uh, Y and X anymore. You can actually change them. So all you need to do is make contact uh, with them and press enter, enter, and you can change them to anything you like. So um, for all intents and purposes, I'm showing here an Argan diagram. You know, we've got real of Z and we've got um, imaginary of Z. And we've got two sliders. Now you can see why N was bold on the previous page. So the slider settings, now N is the degree of the polynomial, so N equals um, 3. And so if I go into the settings, I've got the variable is N. At the moment it's 3. I'm happy to go from 1 to 10. And what you can do is to, to check these boxes, you just press the uh, click button in the centre of the navigation pad, so minimise is checked. So my feeling is that it's best to have it minimised, particularly for handhelds. And also in this instance we're showing the variable. That's why you can see n equals 3. The slider settings up here are a little different. Notice that this k equals 1 appears when we hover over the uh, slider. And what I'm doing here is I'm pressing a control menu, as Raymond said, is the same as a right click. Control menu, right click go to settings and this is basically saying that we could generate a hundred random cubic polynomials of degree three. All right? So that's um, giving you an explanation of why that signum of k is acting like a counter. And notice that if you go down that show variable that's not checked and that's why you see that k equals one when I hover over the slider and you don't see on display 
um, all the time. The other point that I want to make is not the, uh, the end values. And what you can do is you can hide them or show them by pressing uh, menu and then you go to number two view and then you go to now see how there it says number eight show axis end values. If they were on the screen, this would say hide axis end values. So it's a show hide toggle situation. Uh, and the other thing about this screen is I've gone from, I, I think it looks as though negative five to five. Um, I haven't checked this out totally. I'm hoping each time you capture it, you know, all the routes. <laughs> um, if, if, if you find that you don't on the location, you may need to widen uh, the window. And the other thing you'll notice is, and I'll show you how to get this in a moment, the number of routes is, is three. So, and also note that you see this text and then you've got this pin. And also here we've got text and pin. Now what I've done there is I've actually pinned these so that they don't move. So how do you do that? Well, you press menu and then you go for number one for actions, number seven for text. And then you type Peter, press enter, press escape to get out of the text box. And then if you make contact with the text and uh, see how uh, it's control menu, you, you press six for pin and it's, and, and it's pinned. You can't, uh, you can't move it. So that's a, a, a nice feature for the design um, of these pages. Um, so what happens here is now, let's see what happens. So at the moment we've got a situation of one real and a complex conjugate pair. One real complex conjugate pair, one real complex conjugate pair. So we want the students to notice the, the number of roots and their nature to build up an understanding in, of the conjugate root theorem and also uh, which is a consequence of the fundamental theorem uh, of algebra. So if we can go up to n equals four, notice that number of roots changes to four. And here we've got um, two reals and a pair of complex conjugates. So we can, you know, and you can ask the students, what are the possible sets of roots? So you could have, um, you know, four real roots. But for n equals five, here we have an instance of two complex conjugate pairs. And you can see, um, you know, you get these lovely things up here. Uh, Peter, it sounds like um, Peter's communication is starting to break up on us. Just from an algebra, Peter, sorry from a, to in, but largely from an algebra. Right. So, sorry, sorry to butt in, but your communication is just getting a bit juddery. I don't know whether you're not paying your phone bill or uh, whether everyone else is on the internet at the same time as you down there. Okay. Uh, last thing, um, if you can see it, is, uh, just to show you how this come, how you can get this uh, generated, is press menu, and then number one for actions, set for text, type in five, press enter, press escape, then make contact with the five, uh, control menu or right click. You want to store that. Now I noticed that I, on my previous page, I had NR for number of roots. Right, so now I've got that there. And if I change, see how number of roots is equal to six. So that's how you get that onto the screen. Um, no time to do differential equation uh, graphing. Uh, we might do that uh, in an upcoming webinar. Um, apologies for the, uh, for the audio. And I'm now going to pass back to the host. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Peter. There's a lot to take in there. Um, so, uh, so thank you for all of that, and, and thank you very much to, to Raymond as well. Um, a very informative email, uh, webinar, um, and I have to say I'm glad that it was recorded, um, so because there's lots lot demonstrated tonight. So we're going to begin wrapping things up. If you have any last-minute questions, please try and get those asked. 
as I know Raymond and Peter will endeavour to get them answered. When you leave tonight, the webinar tonight, a brief summary, survey, sorry, oh, blimey, will automatically appear here in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events and we, we will listen to your feedback and we hope you share your thoughts in a post-webinar survey. An important thing is your uh, certificate of attendance and this will be emailed to you in the next 48 hours along with a link to the on-demand and YouTube version of the recording as well as any, uh, any relevant documents that Peter and Raymond uh, talked about tonight. Uh, if you do need, after tonight, any post-webinar follow-up, please feel free to phone us or email. Um, T.I. would love to hear from you. So, I'm sorry to say that brings us to the end of tonight's webinar. Thanks so much, Ray and Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Cheers. Yeah, we really appreciate everything you shared, so thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in, uh, for want of a better word. Uh, we hope to see you back online soon. And have a fantastic evening. Good night for now. Bye-bye.